and welcome back. Now today we're going to have a very, very brief look at my workshop and how we turned this back garden, well, a bit of a field really, isn't it, into this. Yeah, it was a long journey, longer than I thought, but let's have a very quick look at the construction process. So let's skip forward to when the garden stones were laid and we can see the base. Now those two pipes sticking up, on the left hand side it's my WAN connection, broadband, and on the right hand side it's the power. The builders basically put a conduit under the ground, laid um, the tubes down and a cord, well, they, a pull cord so they can uh, bring the cables through when they need it. Well, the electrician anyway. Now a quick shout out to my sponsor, JLC PCB. They're doing a collaboration with Easy EDA. As you know, it's my preferred PCB CAD program. It's simple but powerful. It's intuitive to use. Let's just have a quick look at a design I made recently. So here's a fairly recent design of mine, my ESP32 web radio. Designed it in Easy EDA because it had all the features that I needed. And uh, don't forget the teardrop feature that allows the tracks to be slightly bigger at the ends where they join pins and things to give them a bit more stability. And then you just click the Gerber button at the top here. So that one there. And it says, great, you can either generate your Gerber files directly or all of them at JLCPCB. And if you click that, it will go straight to the JLCPCB site, upload the Gerber files as it's generating them in the background automatically and uh, show you what you can do there. And let's not forget, they got a Facebook group. Here it is. And as you can see, they're joining forces here a bit more transparently so we understand that the two are connected. Easy EDA to design your PCB and JLC PCB to actually manufacture it. Sounds good to me. And if you join the group, there's all sorts of good things on the way. So have a look at that as well. JLC PCB, go and have a look. Okay, now the other thing to note here is that the bricks you see there, it's a layer of engineering bricks on a concrete base, which means the actual framework does not sit directly on the concrete base, potentially getting wet. It sits on that layer of bricks, thus ensuring it's 100% dry. Now with three builders on site, um, they've done this sort of thing before, and with the right tools and the materials all to hand, as you can see, they're creating this framework really, really quickly. And within half a day, the actual framework was up, as you can see here. Um, now, they got the, the roof to put on their 150 mil um, joists, and um, you know, once the framework's done, then they can start wrapping it in um, a sort of waterproof membrane. It allows the water vapor out, but it's totally waterproof and doesn't allow the water back in. And the roof is uh, standard plywood, um, and you'll see a little bit more about the plywood roof later on in my actual video. So here's the actual construction wrapped now with this sort of membrane and you can see they're starting to put on the cladding. This is uh, treated wood, um, all cut to size. And inside we have this Celotex type insulation. It's 100 mil, as you can see, four inches, and it's wedged very firmly in between the rafters, making it really, really well insulated. Now the roof you can see going on there, we'll see a little bit more about that. That's a rubber roof, a single sheet with some plastic edging. Oh yes, then they went away and let me uh, paint it for about a week, which took forever. Two coats so far, need another coat to go on uh, before the winter starts in 2021. And then they persuaded me to actually skim the inside of the workshop with, um, on top of the plasterboard this is, so you've got plywood on the inside, shuttering, then plasterboard, and then they're going to skim it because they said, A, it's a lot stronger and makes it, well, a bit more like a room, you know, an office, which is effectively what this place is, isn't it? I don't know what he's looking in that bucket for. What does he expect to find? Perhaps a couple of goldfish. Anyway, there it is all nicely skimmed and drying out. It's very dark there, um, but that plaster became very, very light. And there's my very, very first bit of shelving that went up. A workshop, actually. It's a workbench. And you can see it rapidly increased. Well, I say rapidly. It took several days. Ah, and there was my helper. Look at him, look. Isn't he sweet? He's wondering what's going on. That's Dougal. He's my Yorkshire Terrier. Yeah. All right, the consumer unit uh, was installed by the electrician, and then I just put some conduit, surface mount conduit for lights and power around the place. There are my two uh, switches, one for the kill switch and the lighting. And, oh, yeah, this is a little thing I just did for Amazon. Um, you just drill a hole for the cables in my workbench, uh, put that little white thing in. The cable then goes through that white uh, grommet, and it all looks nice and neat without having them strung across my bench like they were last time. Welcome to my man cave. 
also things that um, are perhaps noteworthy I don't know let's have a look well first of all we have an overhang on the top here so if I come around the side you'll see that there is an overhang there of about 500 millimeters which keeps basically all the front here pretty dry um, the doors and windows of course if it gets windy and really blowy it still gets a little bit wet but it's it's pretty good right what's round the back of the workshop there's the side entrance has about 800 millimeters wide towards the back of the garden let's see what's around there so around the back what we have here in fact are three large sort of Kita plastic bins of the sort used for storing outdoor sort of garden equipment and on the very back you can just see there on the right hand side there's my wood store attached to various things on my rear wall of the workshop uh, that works okay but I'm just process of actually updating all this sort of plastic stuff here to make it uh, a bit more waterproof and a bit more user friendly but as a as a stopgap measure that worked actually quite well now if we just go over to the bins there's a bit of a problem with these bins now these three bins are reasonably large big hinged lids so these two are identical in fact that one's very similar and they're sort of separated out into um, you know, Arduino type components, fixtures and fittings, and the first one over there is tools. But there's a there's a massive problem that I've already come across with these bins. I wonder if you can figure out what it is. And the problem is exactly what you're looking at right now. These are the back of my workshop. They can't really be seen from the front, or well, they can't be seen at all from the front. Only if I look around the side of the workshop can I see this bin here. And as you can see, the lids are open at the minute. What happens if it starts raining? Yes, you've guessed it. The contents are going to get severely wet. Not that I would actually leave them open like that intentionally, but yes, you've guessed it. That one was left open um, all day once when it was raining quite heavily. So even now there are crates in here that have still got an inch of water in the bottom that I haven't actually managed to drain off yet. Yeah, I'm going to have to do something pretty quick to stop that happening again. We'll think about that in a future video. Moving on around the back of the uh, workshop, the ladder is also on a hook down there, and we come to the other side. Uh, this is facing the house side. At one point of note is that um, the roof, see there, is one continuous sheet of rubber that goes all the way across the roof and um, provides absolute total waterproofness, if you like and goes down into the gutter down here um, and there's the downpipe that works very well okay I think it's about time I took you on a tour of the inside very briefly just a few points to mention what I did and why I did some of the things okay let's go in shall we so main entrance and as you can see I have my little red bins on the side again for all the components that I use every now and again I'm hoping they can actually get used a bit Bit better this time than last time because now I can actually get to them much more easily and as we look uh, directly as we come in for the door my printer and shredder are there nice and accessible which means I can change the ink cartridge without hitting my head on the shelf or book workbench above it a few tools and stuff that I've just bought with me and put on a, a shelf a few files and various Arduino type components like that not particularly sorted out well yet they just come from one workshop to another and to the left you'll see lots of these little tiny boxes full of stuff that I've been working on oh yes and my juggling balls so you can see here on the right you can see um, the three workstations from the rear and I did this very deliberately so that the workbench came out from the wall so that we can access all the computer stuff underneath the workbench just by removing these panels and this is basically where I spend an awful lot of my time uh, going through Arduino code and what have you. But the big difference about this workshop compared to the previous one, apart from the fact this, this PC bench comes out from the wall and therefore gives me a, an awful lot more room, is I've got a, a workbench behind me where I can do sort of components uh, testing and building and all the sorts of things that needs power supplies and oscilloscopes and what have you. And then on the right hand side, over there, I have my, my soldering station. And as you can see, I have the heat guns and, and soldering irons and what have you with all the components that I probably need 
when I'm building stuff above. They haven't been sorted out yet either. It's all a bit early days for that. And then finally, to the right, over there, it's what I call my DIY type bench. So in this area, it's where I would do the sort of stuff that, you know, is a little bit messy. You need drills and, and uh, screwdrivers and what have you. And so the mess is contained over here and I can get the vacuum cleaner out and vacuum this particular area up very quickly. I don't do an awful lot of, you know, proper DIY as such. So it's only a, a metre long, this particular bench, but it's up higher. It's, um, it's over, I think it's a metre high. It used to be 900 mil in my previous place, but I took my lessons from that place and go, no, I need it higher, mainly because I'm taller, so I don't want to crouch down over the bench. I want to stand up without getting a backache. So this one's a metre high. And then finally over here, there's just a, a cupboard that I use for my stationery. Over in the corner there, you can see the consumer unit with various things wired into it, and the PIR burglar arm in the corner, and various tools across the top shelves that um, I just randomly place there at the minute until I get a chance to finally sort them out. Yes, along with those up there, which is sort of Arduino and Raspberry Pi related, and I know that I'm going to have to, well, do something with them over the forthcoming weeks or so. So heating's provided by this small little convector. Now you might think in a workshop this size, this little two kilowatt convector just wouldn't be enough to sort of give me the heat that I need. But believe me, because this workshop is constructed in that insulated fashion, this is more than enough, even on a cold day. Now, prior to filming this, I don't know, two, three weeks ago, it went down to sort of zero or close to zero outside. And in here, it's still plus 10. And today, for example, it's 24, I think it says over there. My eyes, oh, I can't quite read it. It's extremely well insulated, this workshop. So this little two kilowatt convector works like a dream. It's what I took with me from my previous workshop. So I know that it's pretty efficient. It could do with um, some sort of fan to circulate the air, uh, which you might have seen over in that cupboard, but it's just not that important. This works well. Now there is a problem with the heater, well not the heater itself, but the control of the heater. So there we can see the plug for the heater. Um, it's actually got a number three on it because that plug came from something else in my previous place, but never mind about that. Now that's plugged into um, an Alexa controlled uh, switch, basically an ESP8266. Uh, so I could ask she who must be obeyed, I'm not saying the name again, uh, to switch it on and off and I think I can even get a schedule set up so it comes on at say half past six and goes off at 6 p.m. but that's not really good enough is it? Let me explain why. Now just like in my previous workshop I have this master kill switch and that if I switch that off that kills all the power to the sockets above my workbench you know things like the oscilloscope and the power supplies of the soldering station things that potentially you would not want to leave on accidentally or overnight or something. Uh, there is a permanent supply running underneath the workbench for things like the computer and uh, the printer. I'll leave that on 24 in eco mode. Uh, and that, that works well. But of course, when I leave here in the evening and switch that off, it doesn't switch off the heater because that heater socket knows nothing about what's going on with the main power supply. So what I'm thinking of is a solution to control that heater via that kill switch. For example, what I could do is have a little tiny plug-in ESP8266 attached to the, um, the kill switch power supply, the stuff that powers most of the stuff in this workshop, just to give out a signal every few minutes, every five minutes, say, that a receiver on that heater supply, which is entirely separate and runs to the consumer unit independently, receives. So as long as it keeps getting this sort of heartbeat signal like, yes, the main power in the workshop is on, I'll do nothing, I'll just stay on. But the minute I hit that kill switch, within five minutes, the receiver by the heater would no longer receive that message. So the heater device, another ESP8266 potentially, could say, hang on, I've not received my heartbeat signal. Um, what's going on and maybe it would wait another five minutes and if it didn't get another signal within that it go that's it i'm switching off and bang heater goes off doesn't stay on all night yeah that's uh, sort of a well it's a safety factor i don't really want the heater on all night and secondly of course the cost factor I mean, it's a two kilowatt heater and uh, yeah 
it, it would cost money to leave it on overnight. And then of course the temperature in here the next morning would be, you know, 28, 30 degrees. So that's another project that I want to do, but that's far less important than those bins at the back of my workshop with the lids that are constantly filling up with water because Dumbo here forgets to put the lids down, I get distracted and they start getting all wet. So that's going to be my first one and the the thinking I'm having here is do I go something like solar? Do I have just a simple battery that only triggers when the lid is up? So the lid up switches the device on which then fires a little signal out to something in my workshop and then goes back to sleep for five minutes and then five minutes later it fires up again but when you put the lid down it kills the entire circuit and we've already well we've got that circuit to hand haven't we my auto on off circuit if you remember that was controlled via a mosfet and well a device at the other end in this in the case of that video it was in fact an arduino but could in fact be any microcontroller that has an output so all these thoughts are buzzing through here at the minute and they're going to provide uh, something for us to think about over the next uh, few weeks but I've got to get those bins sorted out quickly but I do not want that green bin to fill up with water again it's absolutely ridiculous I couldn't believe it in the morning I came around the corner and it's like oh my goodness all that rain and literally there was you know there was that much water at the bottom of each of those uh, crates inside there which I had to tip out and of course that sort of damp atmosphere is not really good for the tools to say the least. It's probably worth mentioning desk heights. So this desk height with the computers on it is 73 centimeters from the ground as that seems to be the standard work station height. However, the one at the back behind that seat, that's higher. That's something like 850 centimeters high so that I can work at that station without once again bending my back down whilst I'm testing out all the components. And as I said before, that DIY bench there, that's a meter high. And I've used that a little bit while I was doing all the stuff in the, in the workbench. And it really is a nice height. When I'm showing you the kill switch, next to it are two switches for two fluorescent lights. They're not fluorescent, that's a lie. They're LED lights. Let's move with the times. So I've got it, control here of two different strip lights, LED strip lights, above my head. So that's one above the computer station, pretty much. And the other one's sort of central. And there's a third one over there that isn't normally on. And it's controlled by an independent switch. Um, but it has to be on at the same time as this one here. And that's for when I do stuff over in the workbench area, the DIY workbench. If I turn that on, as you can see, it produces nice light. Because with my eyes, I need every ounce of light that I can get. When I wired all this up, I decided to have surface mount conduit, 20 millimeter conduit, as I say, because uh, I didn't know exactly where all these lighting fixtures were gonna go, or indeed the mains power ones. So they're sort of scattered around the workbench. You can probably just see them poking out underneath. And the permanent supply that I mentioned before is actually underneath the workbench, because that's mostly where they're needed. So one's hiding down there, for example. and provides permanent power for when I actually need it. And of course, it does go to the computers, which are on 24-7. One final note about the construction of the walls here. So as well as that timber framing you saw, and then we had um, shuttering ply on the inside. And then on top of that, we have 12 millimeter plasterboard. So that means I can screw through the plasterboard into the 12 mil sh uh, shuttering ply, which is really cheap basically but strong enough to screw up things like shelves however the workbench like the one I'm sitting on here at the minute it just wouldn't be strong enough to do that so I've actually screwed all these workbenches in big angle brackets directly through the walls into the timber stud work at the back there we have an example that's a 400 mil wrought iron bracket here and that goes directly into the back of the wall through the plasterboard, through the shuttering ply and into the stud work behind with some pretty chunky screws. I've got to say they're they're pretty long. They're about 100 mil long. They're probably Torx rather than Posi because I find Torx just works so much better. So on the floor, as you can see by my computer chair there, I've got this, uh, this chair mat that's designed for low pile carpet. It goes right away across the whole thing. 
which means I can roll the chair up and down without damaging the carpet. The carpet being uh, carpet tiles, in fact. I ordered uh, three boxes of tarpet, carpet tiles, double-sided tape, spent a happy morning putting those down. And uh, yeah, they can be easily replaced if need be. So that's pretty much it really. That's a whirlwind tour of my workshop. The internal dimensions are uh, 3.5 meters that way and three meters back to front. Once again, that was taken from the previous workshop that was just that little bit too small, especially if my wife came in and wanted to watch something on the computer screens, you know, buying something. Uh, it was just too cramped. Here, I've got, well, space to spare, haven't I? And it's, it's nice and airy and feels large. Well, mainly because it is large. I would consider this to be a fairly large workshop. Not one of those you find in the States where you have lathes and sawmills and things like that, but for a, an Arduino type electronics laboratory, I think this is this is the perfect size now. Absolutely perfect. Okay, that's all I've got time for this week. If you've got any questions about the workshop, if you've got any specific, you know, constructional questions, I can probably answer them. If you've got any questions or more comments about the way you did things differently, I'll be very interested to know. Great, thanks for watching. See you in the next video. I hope you're finding these videos useful and interesting. There are plenty more videos to choose and a couple are shown below. And if you'd like to subscribe to this channel, just click on my picture below and enjoy the rest of the videos. Thanks for watching.